With the first installment of Denis Villeneuve's highly anticipated two-part adaptation of Frank Herbert's Dune on its way, I've been exploring the unique elements and characters that make up this classic science fiction story. Frank Herbert's iconic novel Dune begins with an epigraph attributed to the Princess Irulan of House Carino. Her character is unique in that we are first introduced to and come to know more about her through her writings first, as each chapter of Dune begins with an excerpt from her written works. These writings are in the form of diary entries, historical commentary, quotations, and philosophy. These entries help to set the tone for each chapter, providing context and other details which serve to enhance the reader's understanding of this complex universe and the themes within. While Irulan herself doesn't actually appear in person until the end of the novel, both the 1984 David Lynch adaptation as well as the sci-fi miniseries have used this character in the opening narration to set the stage for the story of Dune. In this video, I'd like to talk about the lore behind Princess Irulan, why her works are so often quoted in Frank Herbert's series, and whether or not we could expect to see her character in Denis Villeneuve's upcoming adaptation of the Dune Saga. Princess Irulan of House Carino is the eldest daughter of the 81st Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV and his wife, Anarul, a Bene Gesserit of hidden rank. Emperor Shaddam has five daughters altogether and no sons. Members of the Bene Gesserit possess the ability to choose the gender of their offspring at conception, and Anarul was under orders to bear only daughters to Shaddam as part of their plan to control humanity. Anarul and Shaddam's marriage was arranged by another member of the Bene Gesserit, Margot Fenring, as a means for the sisterhood to gain influence over the imperial throne and ensure that Shaddam would not have a male heir. Like her mother, Irulan is noted to have been trained in the deepest of the Bene Gesserit ways, destined to be a reverend mother herself. However, she never undergoes the dangerous spice agony ritual to achieve the status. Still being one of the youngest members of the sisterhood, she received training in the techniques of observation, memory, and self-control. One reason why Irulan received this training as a Bene Gesserit was so that as the Emperor's eldest daughter and heiress apparent to the Golden Lion throne, she could be used to the sisterhood's advantage upon its inheritance. Irulan was also conditioned to be a lady of refinement and elegance befitting her station, and though being trained as a Bene Gesserit who exist only to serve the sisterhood's plans, she still held a strong sense of self, which at times was a source of tension between her and her equally strong-willed father. Ultimately, it was said that she never truly excelled in either her courtly or Bene Gesserit studies. It was speculated at one point by Lady Jessica that Irulan was too proud to progress very far with her Bene Gesserit training, and that the sisterhood did not seek to rectify that because most of her usefulness to them came from her being Shaddam's daughter and not from her abilities. This fact is highlighted in Children of Dune, noting that Irulan had never been the most accomplished adept in the Bene Gesserit, valuable more for the fact that she was a daughter of Shaddam IV than for any other reason being often too proud to exert herself in extending her capabilities. In the book, Irulan is described as a tall blonde woman, green-eyed, a face of patrician beauty, classic in its hauteur, untouched by tears, completely undefeated. Baron Vladimir Harkonnen himself also noted that Irulan had eyes which looked past and through him. In Dune Messiah, she is described as a tall blonde beauty, carrying herself with the haughtiness of an aristocrat but something in the absorbed smoothness of her features betrayed the controls of her Bene Gesserit background. When Irulan was around 14 years old, her father led her down a hall of portraits to show her one bearing the likeness of the Duke Leto Atreides of Caladan. It is here that he reveals to her that had she been older, he would have wished for her to have been wed to the Duke. This is when she realizes that her father secretly wished the Duke had been his son, and just how much he disliked the political necessities that made them enemies. From an early age, it was her father's intention for Irulan to become Empress after his death, or to be wed to a political ally in order to retain House Carino's dominion and influence over the Imperium. As the Emperor carried out his plot to destroy Duke Leto and House Atreides, with the aid of House Harkonnen, Irulan was gradually drawn into the events that unfolded on Arrakis. As the power and influence of Leto's House Atreides grew among the Landsrad, it was speculated that Irulan could be married to Leto's son, Paul, 
This would symbolize Shaddam's approval of House Atreides and peacefully assuming the imperial throne after his death. However, like Irulan, the Emperor also has a strong sense of pride, jealousy, and ambition for his house, which has ruled the Imperium for over 10,000 years. This is what ultimately motivates him to plot against the Atreides. Baron Vladimir Harkonnen agreed to take part in this plot as he saw the benefits of removing the rival House Atreides, attaining the riches of the Arrakis fief, and a potential marriage alliance between Princess Irulan and the Harkonnen heir apparent, Ratha. The Baron has ambitions of his own, and their union would be critical for his plan to usher in the new Harkonnen Empire. However, being such an independent thinker, Irulan was opposed to the idea of being used as a pawn in this way. Irulan's ideals contrasted with the mindsets of those by whom she was surrounded. In the environment she was raised in, it was commonplace to promote the sacrifice of personality to the benefit of the political structure, and to sacrifice family loyalty in the quest for power. Irulan instead developed an admiration for the virtues of love and devotion, which to many were considered old-fashioned. In the Dune Encyclopedia, it is noted that one tendency that emerged early in her life was an obsession with writing. Beginning at the age of five, she began to keep a journal and later confided her thoughts to a diary. This diary enabled her to develop her analytical abilities, especially in regards to human character, and her journal prepared the way for her growth as a historian. These journalistic abilities and her introspective tendencies were enhanced by the Bene Gesserit training, which emphasized the skills of observation and analysis. Although less frequent in occurrence, her writings are continually cited throughout the Dune Saga, and are masterfully used by Herbert in enhancing the story. As the saga plays out, her love of writing becomes a much-needed source of comfort, and even an escape from the circumstances she finds herself in. As noted previously in the live-action adaptations of Dune, Irulan has been the de facto narrator, which makes sense considering how notable of a historian she is. Virginia Madsen, in one of her first big roles, portrayed the character in David Lynch's 1984 film. In Madsen's words, her role through the rest of the movie essentially equated to being a glorified extra. In the 2000 sci-fi miniseries, Irulan was portrayed by actress Julie Cox, and in order to increase the character's role in the series, an extensive subplot was invented and some actions were taken from other characters in the book, namely Margot Fenring, and attributed to Irulan to accommodate this expansion. Director John Harrison said that he felt the need to broaden her role because she plays such an important part in the later books, and because of how pivotal her historical works are in the story of Dune. I can certainly appreciate those reasons, and it does serve to reveal what is going on behind the scenes in House Carino, especially when it comes to the plot against House Atreides. Given that there has been no casting announcement for Irulan in Denis Villeneuve's adaptation, as well as the fact that Irulan doesn't physically appear until the end of the book, I don't think it's likely that we'll be getting another voiceover narration from the character to open this film. Also, because Villeneuve's Dune only covers the first two-thirds of Frank Herbert's novel, I'll be surprised if she makes any on-screen appearance. However, as the miniseries director John Harrison brought out, she plays a very important role in the outworking of the Dune saga, so it'll be interesting to see if Denis decides to expand upon her role in some way in his adaptation as well. Also, if we get a chance to see follow-up projects after this first film, the character will definitely be getting significant screen time as the story moves forward. And considering who I would like to see cast in this role, given the description of Irulan in the books, I think the actress Anya Taylor-Joy would be a fantastic pick. In previous projects, the actress has certainly demonstrated the ability to capture Irulan's regal presence. But I'm curious to know who you think would be best suited to portray Princess Irulan. Are there any particular qualities or scenes from the character that you would like to see featured in future films? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave a like if you did, and be sure to subscribe for more Dune and other sci-fi and fantasy content. Thank you all so much for your support, and as always, have a very nerdy day.